Tonight we're having a look at the, the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Tonight we'll have a look at the Holy Spirit. The Father is the Creator. He's the one who has the plans. He's the one who uh, has the will. He's the one whose will counts. He's the one who is called God in the, in the Scriptures. Although Jesus and the Holy Spirit are equally divine and are technically God, members of the Godhead. What we find in the Christian revelation, of course, is that God is three persons, equal. Equal in majesty, equal in power, equal in being God. But the Father is the one who is called God by Jesus and supposed to be by us as well. He's, he's God. He's, he's the one who has the plan. It's his will. The Son and the Holy Spirit are submitted to the will of the Father. Jesus said his, his food was to do his Father's will. The Father's will is my food. I will do that. Every turn. It's a tremendously wise choice. The Father's will, the will of the Father, is the only thing that's worth doing in this life. The only thing. There's nothing else worth doing. If it isn't God's will, it's not worth doing. And in fact, the, the will of the Father is the only thing worth doing and the only thing that works. It's the only thing that works ultimately. And yet, you know, so often we fight it kind of thing. Father then, the Creator, Jesus, is the Savior. He's the one who interacts with God's creation. He's the one who saves us. He proclaims the good news. He heals. He touches the sick, as we talked about last time. He founds the church. He sends the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Son, eternal Son, return to the Father's right hand, interceding for us now. That's Jesus. Different role. We'll notice then in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there are different roles. They're equal. And yet they have different roles. The Father knows the future. Jesus said one time that he didn't. That he didn't. I'm not sure how they worked that out among them, but that's what Jesus said. They have different roles, although equal. The Holy Spirit, then, our topic for tonight is the third person. We say it's called paraclete, which means advocate, called advocate as well, called consoler, counselor, comforter. It is the Holy Spirit who activates things. It is the Holy Spirit who ministers the power of God. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that heals. So it was the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the tomb. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus invoked to bring Lazarus out of the tomb. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus used to bring Mary Magdalene to an incredible, magnificent conversion. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's role. The Holy Spirit is the one who gets things done. He gets them done. The Holy Spirit's name is, is connected with fire a number of times in the Scriptures, in the New Testament. Fire. The fire that burns, the fire that, that drives, the fire that sets us, sets us to the Lord's work. At any rate, Jesus said in Luke 12, 49, said this, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And my heart right now, he said, is fairly bursting to see it already ablaze. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. Not here yet. I wish it were. That's the Holy Spirit. He was talking about the Holy Spirit, whom he and the Father would send. The Holy Spirit arrived on Pentecost amid the, some of the signs were of fire, weren't they? The tongues of fire over their heads and so on. Holy Spirit, fire. Fire purifies, doesn't it? Fire can destroy too, that's not the Holy Spirit's role. But fire is a good, a good symbol for the Holy Spirit. You, know, you talk about somebody who's all fired up. Remember when I was uh, teaching high school and coaching basketball? I coached basketball for 18 years. You know, part of the, uh, the basketball thing when you're coaching a team is like you'd get timeouts. Basketball coach would have five timeouts per game. Timeout, 
The players would come over to the bench and the coach would have something to say to the players, you know. And I don't know if the things I said to them were all that profound and so on, but that was one of the things we did. I remember going to a, an exhibition, a basketball game uh, just south of Buffalo, a preseason game between the Buffalo Braves at that time and the Cleveland, uh, whoever they were, I forget who they were. Anyway. And we sat, it was in a junior college gym, which held about 4,000 people. We sat right behind the Buffalo Braves bench. Well, this was a big thrill for me, and some of my players were there too. Ernie DiGiacomo sat on one of my players' feet. He never cleaned that shoe again <laughs> after that. But the coach for the Buffalo Braves was Dr. Jack Ramsey, who was the, I guess, the one of the greatest technicians of basketball that ever lived. Very, very technical. And I thought, this is my opportunity to listen to what the great Jack Ramsey has to say to his players when there's a timeout. So sure enough, the first timeout, I'm leaning forward, and all these big skyscrapers are standing around, and the coach is looking up at them and saying, OK, guys, let's, let's get the boards. Let's play some defense for a change. Come on, let's go. Let's, let's get out there and swarm around and get some points. I thought, good heavens. Even I wouldn't give that kind of elementary instruction to my team. That was the great Jack Ramsey. Anyway, one time at school, I thought, I, I went, went to one of the football games after school, and uh, they don't have the same kind of timeouts in football. But between the quarters, you know, the, the team comes off, or the, the defense comes off, and the offense goes on, vice versa. So I crept up behind the bench, and I, I listened to, uh, to the, the senior football coach give his team some instructions uh, during the, the time that he had them on the sideline. You know, the defense came off. That was it, yeah, okay. And the offense, blah, 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 and he was talking to them. And the final, the upshot of the whole instruction was, Let's get all fired up, you guys. Let's get all fired. Get fired up now. Get fired up and get out there and do it. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're sh you know, shoulder pads and elbow pads also. All that very macho type of thing. I was the, pretty well the summary of the wisdom of the, of the football uh, program, you know. Anyway, being fired up, I think we all know what that means. Well, that's why the symbol of fire is appropriate for the Holy Spirit. It's appropriate. Sure it is. Anyway, Jesus also said, I am with you all days, even to the very end of the world. That's at the end of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 28, I believe. Okay, we're with you all days. Jesus is with us, of course, in the Blessed Sacrament of the Altar, in the tabernacle, in that, in that incredible gift to, to, to his people that we'll talk about somewhat later in this whole series. But also, Jesus is present to us through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, with us all days to the very end of the consummation of all things. Jesus said himself, and actually, in a sense, is quoting from the, the four gospel writers who wrote later, of course, and said, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Not many days hence, you will be baptized, all of you, with the Holy Spirit. And we have to have a look at that. What does that mean, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? It is not an expression that I grew up familiar with. But I'm familiar with it now. When you look at the documents of the church and the things that the Holy Fathers have been saying, they're familiar with it. But you know, most of us don't read the things that they, they write and that kind of thing. But you and I, we need to be in touch with what being baptized with the Holy Spirit means. I believe it's a critical need in the church. Always has been, and particularly in our day. We need, need to know what it is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we want to talk about that a little bit. We get to that. So you'll be baptized. And all four Gospels as they, uh, have that comment out of the mouth of John the Baptist. The one who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I baptize with water. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels. Very few things are in all four Gospels, but that's one of them. 
baptized with the Holy Spirit. I believe in my life there was a time when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, maybe 22 years ago or something like that. And I can't say, I can't say that, that as a result of that, that I had something that the other people, you know, that I knew, my friends who I didn't, didn't have. I, can't, I couldn't say that. I couldn't say I was, I was any better than any of the other people. But what I could say is that I now had something that I didn't have before. It was very different, very different. The experience of being baptized with the Holy Spirit was very, very different. And I believe very, very good, obviously, and very, very important, very important. All of us need to be living in, walking in the baptism, if you like, of the Holy Spirit. We need that. We need somehow to be able to draw our children into that. If the Lord can just get hold of them and get them baptized with the Holy Spirit, it won't be nearly so hard for you and for I to, to, to get to them, sort of keep them hanging around and stuff. Okay, well, let's just move ahead a little bit now and ask, try answer the question, what does the Holy Spirit do? What does he do? I have five or six things here. Number one, as I see it, the number one role of the Holy Spirit is to witness to our spirits, to our souls, to witness to us who Jesus is. Jesus said in John 15, 26, he will bear witness on my behalf. He will bear witness to me. He will tell me inside where I know things. He will tell me who Jesus is. When I am baptized with the Holy Spirit, the first thing that I am able to say with incredible conviction is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, made so by his Father. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day when he comes back, every knee will bend, every head bow, every tongue will acclaim him, as that, as the Lord. The Holy Spirit who tells us. When somebody says, well, why didn't he tell me? Well, he will only do that if we invite him to do that. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, and, and do with me what you will, what the Father wants. Witness to me who Jesus is. Let me know in my spirit. Because when I know things in my spirit, I really know them. I know them. I can know things in my mind. But I can't figure everything out in my mind. But when I know it in my spirit, I really know it. There's no question about it at all. And if somebody says, prove it, I say, well, I don't care. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just telling you what I know. I know these things. Do I sound arrogant? I don't mean to. I don't mean to look to be patronizing or condescending, but I, I just happen to know this. How do I know? Because the Holy Spirit has witnessed to me. That's his first role is to witness to us who Jesus is. Number two, Jesus says, when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, as he told them in Acts 1, you will, receive, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So number two thing that the Holy Spirit does is to give us the power, to give us the way to witness to others who Jesus is, to bring the word to them, to evangelize them, if you like. You know, there are many ways to do that, and there, there are many wrong ways to do it, and I've seen, I think, most of them over the years. You know, like the poor woman who desperately wanted to get her husband baptized with the Holy Spirit. I've told this story so many times, I feel everybody's heard it, but anyway. It certainly illustrates the point. And she was a bit of an extreme example, but there are all kinds of examples of the wrong way to do it. I met her at a conference, spoke with her after a talk. She came up, said, Father, I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated. It's my husband, she said. And I'm thinking to myself, how often have I heard this? <laughs> husband. There's got to be somebody who knows how to witness to husbands. I don't know who it is. <laughs> but there's got to be somebody out there somewhere. I said, oh, really? What's the problem? Well, she said, I've had such a... It's been so joyful 
And I've been so blessed and everything else with this whole experience of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, but my husband won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. I said, oh, gee, that's too bad. My comments are not always too profound, I'm afraid. <laughs> and she says, I've tried everything. I have tried everything. Oh, really? Uh, what have you tried? I was sorry I asked after. <laughs> what have you tried? And then she told me some of the things she had tried. And pretty well, if you can imagine it, she tried it. She would put little holy cards around the house, of course, in strategic locations. That didn't cut any ice with him. He got fed up with it, of course. He kept throwing them in the basket and stuff like that. She left little tracts, you know, little four-page things, you know, explaining this and that. Nothing. I didn't do any good either. She uh, got even more ingenious. She used to uh, wrap tracts, four, eight-page tracts and so on, up in a little sort of a ball of paper and stuff them in his slippers. <laughs> so he'd come home after the proverbial ha hard day at, at the office or the plant or someplace. He would, you know, want to kick off his shoes and, and put his feet up and read the paper and, of course, try to get his slippers on and couldn't. Couldn't get the, shoe, the foot in the slipper, reach in, pull it out, oh. She used to put little Christian symbols, stickers, around the house. You know, the fish symbol, I won't explain why that's a symbol of Christ, but it is. The little fish symbol, she stuck a couple of those on his shaving mirror. Came down one morning all cut, bleeding. <laughs> she couldn't understand why he wouldn't eat fish anymore. She used to put, uh, she'd make, you know, for like big occasions, his birthday or their anniversary or something, uh, big occasions, she'd make his favorite stuff. Some kind of cake, you know, his fa very favorite. But of course that wasn't enough. She would, with icing sugar or something, put some big uh, slogan on the top, you know, Jesus is Lord. You know. <laughs> Come to me, says the master. And all that. Anyway. And none of it worked. None of it worked. So she, what she was doing was simply reminding me of some of the many, many ways to evangelize uh, without effect. How to do it wrong. There are many, you know, there are only a couple of ways to do it, right? That's to be non-judgmental and prayerful and loving and kind, you know. And at some point, some point, the person has to say, how come you're always so on top of your game? Why are you always so joyful? What's, you know, what's this going on with you anyway? And then you can say, well, now that you've asked, let me tell you for what it's worth. You know. Anyway. So, second thing that the Holy Spirit does is to give us the power, if you like, the direction, the mandate to bring the word to other people. Uh, number three thing, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Jesus says, actually, in John, he's quoted in chapters 14 and 16, 14, 26, 16, 12, and saying the Holy Spirit will teach you everything you need to know. Holy Spirit will teach you. And that, I've seen evidence of that. Like at school back in the, the mid-70s, we had a real revival going in the high school where I taught. We had a prayer meeting on Sunday nights where up to 120 high school students would come on a Sunday night for two hours and praise the Lord. You know, it was quite, it was quite edifying. You know, it has quite a history to it, and it didn't last. And Anyway, I have my own theories about that, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But I remember, like these, these young people, and they'd be from 15 to 19, more or less, a couple of 14-year-olds, they would be somewhere through the process baptized with the Holy Spirit. And among other things, the Holy Spirit would begin to teach them. I remember running into one of them. He was 16 years old. He was grade 11. Good boy. You know, average fellow. Uh, in the hall. Came up to me in the hall with his Bible. With his Bible. Under his arm. Or in his hand. This is my beaten up old Bible here. His was about double the size. It's a big, big book with lots of notes in it and everything. 
And he opened it up to the prophet Isaiah in some chapter, I don't know, 16 or whatever it was. He said, Father, maybe you could help me to understand these lines here. There are two or three verses here I don't quite get. And I looked at them and I said, well, well maybe blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, oh yeah, oh, I never thought of that. And I said, well, how long have you been studying the prophet Isaiah? Oh, three or four days. I said, well, how did he learn all that stuff in such a hurry? Well, he was taught it by the Holy Spirit, I guess. That's what happens. You know, being, having been a teacher and having gone to teacher's college, some of you have, have been teachers and are, you know. Like one of the things they, they talk about is, is motivating the students to learn. Oh, if you have students who want to learn, it's so easy to teach them. But you must take for granted that most of them don't want to learn. They don't give a rip what you do, as long as you don't bother them. You know? Learning readiness is the thing. You know, they have to try to work this learning res readiness into their, their thick skulls or their stubborn minds, you know, and try and get them to, uh, to the point where they want to learn. But you see, what happens when, when a, uh, someone is baptized with the Holy Spirit, he or she is hungry to learn. Is hungry to learn or to read the Bible. Couldn't couldn't make head or tail out of the Bible before that, but now, by golly, it's beginning to make sense. And they want to learn more. They want to get into it. They want to be taught. That's the way it works. The Holy Spirit begins to teach. It doesn't teach everything. Jesus says everything you need to know. Well, the basic stuff, sure. The Holy Spirit doesn't teach everybody everything. There's lots to learn, sort of thing. But that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does do. Number three. Number four. Holy Spirit gives life. The sort of fire thing. Brings things alive, you know. When people are, are keen, enthusiastic about their faith, you can be sure it's the Holy Spirit that's operating inside. There's been a baptism of the Holy Spirit there. Somebody who wants to talk about it who, if he or she is wise, won't press the thing on people who don't want to talk about it, but at the same time is really looking for people to talk to about it. Looking for people. And so delighted to find one. I like to talk about the Lord. I like to talk about what the Lord is doing and, you know, what he's saying, I think. I like that. I love that kind of stuff. I do. Uh, I mean, I talk about other things, too. I'm a hockey fan and, and you know, other things, too, as well whatever, whatever, but uh, I want to talk about the Lord, I do. And when I f meet somebody who obviously wants to and has his or her feet on the ground, praise God, and not head in the clouds, I'm delighted to meet such a person and to talk the whole thing back and forth, you know. But that's the way it is. That's the way the Holy Spirit does that. Brings people alive in faith. Comes in when we invite him, when we step aside. He comes in. Come in, Holy Spirit. One of the things we tried to do here, I tried to do at the beginning when I came to St. Mary's first, was to say to the Lord, come in, take over. I got nothing to give. I got nothing to say. I don't know what to do. You got some clues? Come on in. Take this place over. You know, and like put an anointing in the building. I can't do that. I can't anoint buildings. I can throw oil around, but that doesn't necessarily anoint them, you know. And so on. So this is what it gives life, gives life. The Holy Spirit brings power. The Holy Spirit gives power to human beings who don't have the power, and that's all of us, to accomplish the things the Father wants to accomplish. You know? Like one of the things we have to do, I'm convinced, is to pray with people when they have needs. Pray with them, for heaven's sake. Somebody meets you, I have a terrible headache today. Well, don't let the person out of your sight. So say, here, let me say a prayer for you. You know, and you probably would say, if you've never done this before, you'd probably say what I said the first time, so, you know, that occurred to me, and I felt the Lord was saying, you pray for this girl, you know. You probably feel, oh, no, me, me, oh, no, I, I wouldn't know what to say. I was never trained to do this. I can't do this. Some other time, I'll study it. I'm not ready to do this some other time. That's probably, if you've never done it, that's probably what you do. But it's, there's nothing to it. 
You said, let me pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for this marvelous person. Please take away her headache. It doesn't have to be a big, long prayer, but just a short prayer. You'd be amazed at some of the things the Lord will do. You know, he probably won't do, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, because he probably won't do big, major miracles, but then again, he might, you know. But he'll do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. Amazing. Well, I began to pray with people when I got, got a little confidence. I found that the, the thing that the Lord seemed to want to answer, most of all, was people who had trouble with their teeth. <laughs> Whatever it was, somebody had problems with the teeth, gums, jaw, blah, blah. Uh, and I would pray. The, the results were, were quite interesting. I have other stories to tell that you've probably heard before, most of you, but anyway, I'll tell them again, but not, not tonight. Um, and again and again, somebody would come. Uh, somebody said that you were good at praying for teeth. I said, well, I don't think I'm any good at it, but the Lord is pretty good at it, you know. And I'd pray, and sure enough, there'd be another. Result, another healing, you know. Maybe not big, huge things, but a toothache is, is not very nice either, if you've had one. It's not, it's not a big, earth-shaking uh, problem, is it? Except for you, when you have it. You know how big it is. And when that goes away, that's, that's quite a gift. That's quite a gift. And that would happen with me again, and it still happens amazingly. It just, just still happens. And the humor of it all is, of course, God has a sense of humor. Did you know that? The Lord has a sense of humor. I think he's chuckling to himself half the time. Because before I felt that the Lord was calling me to become a priest, I was going to be a dentist. That's right. <laughs> no, I won't. It's like the Lord is saying, you want to fix teeth? Fix teeth. <laughs> Do both. Do both. Amazing. Good sense of humor. Just a few other pre preliminary ideas about the Holy Spirit. Those are the main things the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit guides the church. The Holy Spirit uh, took the place of Jesus. Jesus says in John 16, 7, an unusual thing. He said to the apostles, the disciples, it is better that I go rather than stay here because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. Now, that's a pretty profound statement if you, if, you, if you have a good look at it. Better for me to go, because if I don't, the Holy Spirit won't come. And that, that'll be tragic. Very important. In the plan of the Father, the Holy Spirit would come. The Holy Spirit is the spouse of Mary. The Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin of Nazareth, and the Son of the living God was conceived in her womb. Jesus took his entire human nature from Mary. His entire human nature was taken from Mary. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then is the spouse of, of Mary. Mary, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. You want to know Jesus? Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Retreat master said that one time. Retreat I was making. The Holy Spirit speaks a language of his own. I don't mean he has a language other than you know, there's some kind of strange line. I don't mean that. But he has a way of speaking that's all his own. And we can't understand him and hear him and, and get it straight with him unless we begin to learn the language. And how do we learn it? We allow him to teach it to us. As we persevere seeking out the word of the Lord for this situation and that, we become familiar with the way the Holy Spirit talks to us. It's like a language, as I say, you just automatically say, well, okay, what are you saying? So it's a good, there's a surrender, there's a repentance, there's all kinds of things. Now, baptism with the Holy Spirit. We have to try to understand what this is. What is it? Is it a sacrament? No, it isn't. Is it connected with confirmation? Not necessarily at all. No, it isn't. The Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the gift of the Father at one point. The Holy Spirit, number one, is given in baptism as a gift to the one being baptized. Number two, the sacrament of confirmation gives the person receiving it a special mandate and a promise of, of uh, power, I guess, or strength 
to go and do the works of God. That's what confirmation does. It's the seal. It's the seal on the soul. It's the mandate of the Christian to get out there and do it for the Lord. That's confirmation does that. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is something else. What that does is to activate the gift that's received in baptism, is to activate it. Or as St. Paul, I think, uh, wrote to Timothy one time, stir up in your soul that gift that was given to you, the Holy Spirit. Stir it up. The Holy Spirit stirs up, unwraps, if you like, the gift. You know what gifts are like. You get them at Christmas time, they're all wrapped up very neatly. You got your name on it, they're under the tree, you take it out, you have it, it's yours. Nobody can take it from you, it's your possession. But you do not experience that gift until you unwrap it until you actively receive it, right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's unwrapping the gift, getting the gift unwrapped that is given in baptism. That's being baptized with the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? It's a simple procedure. We simply need to, to yield to Jesus, to invite him to take up the center, uh, take up his position in the center of our lives, and to ask him to baptize us with the Holy Spirit or to invite the Holy Spirit in and so on. It's very, very simple, not complicated. And believe me, it makes an incredible difference. There can be manifestations at a time like that. One priest that announced that he felt, elect felt he was being electrocuted when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I didn't. I almost fell asleep, in fact, I was so peaceful. And you would say, oh, no, the Lord deals with us the way we are, right? Eh? Like I'm always on the point of falling asleep anyway. So. Calm, collected. How does he coach the basketball team on the bench? Look at him sleeping on the bench there. <laughs> the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, love, and the greatest of these is love, of course. There are gifts of the Holy Spirit enumerated in the prophet Isaiah, kindness, gentleness, etc. The ones we need to have a look at, because we're not as familiar with, I guess, are the ones in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which I will read now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. St. Paul writes to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth took off, eh? had a strong start. The uh, church in Corinth was, was fascinated by, by gifts of the Holy Spirit. The church in Corinth was, uh, uh, was different from a lot of the other churches. There was, a, there was a fascination with the immediate working of the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit wasn't working in the other churches, or as we would call them today, dioceses. But in the church of Corinth, it was, uh, it was more notable. Or more, no, more open to that. They kind of led the church at that time in yielding to the, to the gifts. These are the ministry gifts of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes called the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit. The peculiar charisms of the Holy Spirit. In, in verse 7, to each person the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And that's so important in understanding the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not for me, it's for me to, to use to bless somebody else. That's what it's for. Holy Spirit gifts, the, the Corinthian gifts, are for ministry, for reaching out, for touching, for doing things in other people's lives. To one, the Spirit gives wisdom in discourse. That's wisdom. Okay, we'll uh, perhaps have time to say what each one is, explain it. To another, the power to express knowledge. Wisdom, knowledge. Through the Spirit, one receives faith. Faith. A, a, a ministry gift of faith. Of being able to open up somebody else to receive the gift of faith. That's three. By the same Spirit, another is given the gift of healing. We are all invited to pray for healing. But not all of us are going to have ministries of healing. I don't have one, I don't think, at all. Uh, but we can all pray for healing. But this is, this is for someone who has a special ministry to heal, a ministry gift. Still another is the power to work miracles. That's five, right? Wisdom, knowledge, faith, 
healing miracles. Five, prophecy is given to one, that's six. To another, the power to distinguish one spirit from another, the discernment of spirits. That's six and seven, is it? One receives the gift of tongues. Oh my goodness. Why did the Lord do that? I've asked him a few times. Lord, if there's one thing that seems to mess up the works, it's the gift of tongues. People, oh, I ran into a fellow who used to come here with his family, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, and I didn't, I, he kind of left, I, I lost track of him, but I ran, in, ran into him. Why did you, uh, why did you leave? Well, this reason, that reason, but the real reason came out is the conversation. The temperature of the conversation rose a little bit, and the real reason came out is those tongues. I couldn't stand those tongues. I had to get myself out of there. Oh, okay. You mean they don't have tongues where you go? Aren't they supposed to? I don't know. Vatican Council says they're for today. You know, the Pope says they're for today. And so on. Anyway. And finally, number nine, another than the gift of interpreting the tongues. Peter links the Holy Spirit's coming with the, the prophet Joel. Joel 2.28. You know, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and the others of the 120 in the upper room, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. Holy Spirit fell. They charged out into the marketplace, all fears gone, and began to talk about Jesus. And a lot of people listened, and a lot of people were converted. That was the thing to do that day, it seemed. So Peter links the Holy Spirit's comings with that. Joel says all kinds of things will happen in those days. There'll be dreams and visions and voices and miracles and healings and so on. Things that in some ways the, the church is very cautious about and properly so. You know, like for everybody that comes and says to me, I had a vision. How many, what percentage of those do you think I would, you know, after listening for a bit, I would say, yeah, I think that's pretty authentic. What percentage? I'd hate to tell you. But not all. Considerably less than all. You know, like we can, at least things can be very human. They can. We can, we can work ourselves into anything like this. But nonetheless, the Holy Spirit can do things like this too. Anyway, I remember in one year in my senior high school religion class, I was talking about this, and I thought, well, I might as well throw the whole thing at them, you know. So I talked about, you know, the voice. Some people, you know, occasionally, I said, these things are very, very rare. Very rare. But they're probably not as rare as you and I think they are. That's all I said. After class, one of the young men came up and he said, I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes alone. I said, sure. So we found a place where we could talk alone. And he said, now he's 18 by this time, right? He said, I am going to tell you something that I have never, ever told in my life to anyone. Anyone. And I don't intend ever to tell it to anyone else. I said, wow. I'm going to be on the receiving end of something pretty different here, I guess. I felt very privileged. I was flattered as anything. He said, the reason I'm telling you is that just, just what you've said today in class about those strange things that sometimes can happen and how rare they are. But he said, when I received my first communion, I began to hear the audible voice of God. And uh, I said, really? You know, I mean, I was ready to believe it. That this was a very credible young man. This was no head-in-the-clouds guy. He was a very, very credible young fellow. Very sensible. A lot of common sense. Which is also a gift, right? Of the Holy Spirit, which is not all that common. <laughs> Although it's called common sense. He had lots of that gift. And he... Uh, I said, Really? I said, how long did it last? Well, he says, it still happens from time to time. I still hear the voice of God once in a while. I said, can you tell me uh, some of the things that you feel the Lord has said to you? He said, very, very simple things. Be nice to your mother today. She's having a hard time. Something like that. 
very short little things that the Lord wanted him to do. Why don't you take your little brother out for an outing? He's feeling kind of bad about this, that, or the other thing. Stuff like that. Why don't you just finish your homework? You know, I mean, it'll be so much simpler if you just finish it tonight. Things like that. And he said, I thought when I started to hear that first that everybody, that happened to everybody at First Communion. But it didn't take me long to, to find out that that wasn't the case. And he says, I've never, ever told anybody. <coughs> I don't know where he is now. I've, I even forget his name, for heaven's sake. Anyway, what can I say? The Holy Spirit does a whole pile of things. So, like, there's a danger, two dangers. Number one is saying, I don't believe that kind of stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that's, that's garbage. If the Lord does something, he wants us to be ready to acknowledge the fact that he does it. The other danger is to get so fixated and hung up on things like that that that's the only thing that interests us. There's somebody with a stigmata in, in uh, Macari, Louisiana. No kidding. Airline ticket down. <laughs> There's something happening in Alaska. There's a statue that's, that's, uh, that's uh, exuding oil all over the floor. No kidding. Oh. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. That's the other danger. Is to get so hung up on it that like that's not that's not like those things are not what, what faith is all about. Those things have their purpose. And we have to discern the purpose. Anyway, the gift of Pentecost is still available. The Holy Spirit is not tired, has not retired, has not given up the ghost kind of thing, if you pardon us, sort of pun there. <laughs> that was unintentional, unintentional. <laughs> Used to call the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost, as you know. Holy Spirit's not an afterthought of the Father, not just for extra pious people, not an option, not an option. Holy Spirit is essential for every believer. If the church is going to be what the church is supposed to be, the gift of Pentecost has to be alive in it. Otherwise, the hearts of believers will grow cold, will grow casual. Church going becomes a, a routine, a, a duty. And you can tell when you're with them in church. The church becomes, people become blasé. The church, the parish, loses its signs of life. The liturgy becomes an empty ritual. There's nothing the matter with ritual. Every people on earth have had ritual. Civic ritual as well as religious ritual. Look at what we do. We open parliament every afternoon for the question period, for heaven's sake. The, the parade of the, of the speaker, the speaker's parade. That's ritual. There's nothing the matter with it. We know what it means. But without the Holy Spirit, the ritual of the church becomes empty. And the Catholic Church becomes instead, without the Holy Spirit, becomes the Catholic Historical Society. As we meet simply to think about things that have gone by in the past. There's a comforting line, we'll finish with this in Luke 11:13, where Jesus says, the Father never refuses the Holy Spirit to those who ask. The Father never refuses the Holy Spirit to those who ask. In other words, the Father is so keen to convey the gift of the Holy Spirit to his people that, you know, he'll use almost any excuse to do it, but we have to make some response before that will happen. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the divine trinity, persons in relationship, right? In a sense, God is family. Persons in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and every family on earth, every community on earth is made in his likeness.